Welcome today is so incredibly special. We have my dear friend Susan Robinson with us who works in development for all things for our ministry, Hope Heals, and who is an amazing parent herself. And we will be talking all about parenting today. And Susan is equal parts thoughtful, wise just really processing through the hard things of parenting, but with so much hope in the Lord. And I'm just so excited for you all to get to hear this conversation where she is prepped with questions on her heart, but also that many of you are asking. So it is a gift to have Susan Robinson with us today. All right, well, let's do it. You know, you and I are never at a loss for words. When no, nope, so, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I'm glad to be here with you and with everybody else and Aww. getting to talk about something I've learned so much about from you as yeah. my friend. Yeah, and right. I- I've learned from you. <laughs> Goodness. Well, let's jump back and talk a little bit about what it was like growing up, experiencing any type of theology around suffering. Was this something that was discussed in your home? Um, was there anything you were able to pull from from your childhood or was it something that really you had to form as an adult? It's so interesting to think about because I think both not at all and yet, yes, in some ways. So Mm -hmm. in general, being a child growing up in the 80s and 90s, there was not a lot of emphasis placed on suffering in my upbringing, which would be congruent with many children born in America in that Mm -hmm. time frame. Um, Suffering was not something that we needed to talk about daily because it felt like I was somewhat removed mm-hmm. from most real human suffering. However, I was very drawn and I very much credit my mother for giving me a copy of Cory Ten Boom, The Hiding Place, when I was 12 years old and me oh, yeah. inhaling it. And many stories of deep suffering and my um my faith meant that i was semi wrestling a bit with all not being right in the world mm-hmm. so while my circumstances did not mean i was dealing with up close suffering i was very interested from a young age of discussions of justice and just marginalized people The underdogs of the world always had my heart, um, even from a young age. And you were able to take all of that and apply it. It's almost like that stored treasure inside of yourself. I think so. Yeah, I do think that um, that I mean, what's really crazy to think about, Susan, is that I didn't really have an outlet for my championing of the underdog pre-stroke. I didn't really have the voice Mm. platformed to um champion and and be about really hurting people groups and now i do it's kind of cool and you're able to kind of apply that knowledge to all different types like you're saying different types of people different types of suffering yeah i think so i hope so i pray so i see it oh, i definitely see it. goodness well let's talk about your kids for a second and sure. what it's like for them because when you had your stroke James was six months old yes so there really was no ability to talk to him about what was happening yeah and really that's kind of how he grew and formed right was in this household where he had parents trying to figure out what this meant he just thought maybe this was the norm right so how old was he when he discovered something was different about his family what was that like for you guys and for him But I think for both of them, they know things are very different. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think because of so much of our ministry, so much spent speaking, writing, talking about my stroke, the subsequent disabilities, our unique family, they very much accept it. And I talk a lot about the power of narration, Mm -hmm. that I just think there's so much to be said for parents getting in there and narrating why this is good, Mm -hmm. why this Mm -hmm. is, why this should be radically accepted. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not just unique to 
this story, but as a parent, I'm sure mm-hmm. you'd echo. Sure. I mean, Susan, you're the only one here who's launched a child into the real world. <laughs> so you have more expertise than I do of how to do that. And Kyla is so outstanding. Gosh, oh. I need all your wisdom. But <laughs> I think you'd probably say, yeah, narration is mm-hmm. key. Mm-hmm. And also asking, you know, what is your role in this story? And I think so much of it is about helping them understand their purpose in where they are, that there's purpose where they're planted, the parents that they have, the school that they attend, the neighborhood where they are, that God is using them Mm -hmm. and that they have an ability to influence. And like you said, the way they think about things matters. Oh, for sure. You know, something we often talk to our youngest about because he comes from a really hard story. Yeah is um, that you are a victor, not a victim. Mm. And you have victory over the things that have happened that are so terrible. You're not a victim to those things. It doesn't make them smaller. It doesn't mean they don't hurt. But that when we have victory over something, I think we respond to it a little bit differently. Mm, for sure. And for our listeners who may not know Susan's story, Susan's youngest child is adopted. Yes. From... Uganda. And Mm -hmm. has a hard story. He does. And memories of that. Mm -hmm. So you are so beautifully able to speak into that with him and help him navigate the memories. And I appreciate that about the way you parent too. I think it's empowering to have parents around you that are kind of addressing things in a similar way Mm -hmm. and not shying away from, because I think the tendency is to shy away from talking about these things or pointing them out because you don't, some people will say, well, I don't want to bring it up if they're not thinking about it or if they've already dealt with it. Right. You know, I don't want right. to, I don't want to bring it back up again, but bringing that back up and talking to them about it, giving them language. I think that's another thing you were talking about oh, so much is sure. giving your boys language, giving them context, re-narrating what it means, letting them know they're not alone. Mm-hmm. They're not carrying those mm-hmm. things alone, that you're together as a family carrying oh, gosh. all of that. I mean, It's just, I think it's very similar. I even see James and Amos relating so much that there's almost a connection. Oh, and they have for many years. So so, so sweet. Would you say that having suffering in their story and the formation of their story has shaped them into an individual that has more compassion, that has more emotional depth? Uh, would you say James definitely is that way? definitely i i would think already in james we're seeing like very um yeah just a deep well just mm-hmm. a, a lot there and, and not all like perfect oh mm-hmm. my goodness not at all but um just just a depth that you know he he very much um And he would identify this. This is nothing I shouldn't say. He doesn't fully fit Mm -hmm. with his peers. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you don't. Mm -hmm. And that's just fine. Who needs to fully fit in? I hear that a lot about Amos. He's emotionally mature. Yeah. And I do think that's a lot of pressure that can land on a child that they feel like they do have to always respond in a mature way. So how do you guys make space for the just the childhood, the hormonal, the teenage oh, emotions ooh. in a family that has such good context around suffering and uh, the theology that goes around. I think being quick to forgive and, and I like to utilize a strategy called shake it off. <laughs> you know, whatever just happened, if you and your little brother just had a fight, if it was a bad day at school, whatever, shake it off. You're mm-hmm. going to be fine. You're resilient. Mm-hmm. And really, you know, I think probably something that, that parents are waking up to in our generation is that coddling that mm-hmm. has been so prevalent in American child rearing in recent mm-hmm. generations. But instead, like, nope, you are not a baby anymore. Yeah. You know, you are a like growing child to man and it's time to act like one and that's <laughs> not suck it up yeah. process and yes. pray and become mature and complete lacking nothing come on it's not ignore it it's actually dig in and go through absolutely it. and come out the other side 
And all of their friends and spouses in the decades to come will thank us, correct? Absolutely. <laughs> I say that all the time. Just tell your wife you're welcome from me in advance. You're welcome. Do um, the work now. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. No, they, James and John Church Arrives have on me to thank for the mean good husband. <laughs> I love it. So as we talk about this whole communal sorrow and, and kids are going through hard things, we're going through hard things. How much time do you spend in that? And how much time do you spend saying, all right, we're going to move into the processing and the victory and like, what does it look like to shift gears into that new mindset? Hmm. I think it's constantly back and forth. It's mm -hmm. not one note. I mean, you're always kind of holding the tension of com just communication, I think is so important. Mm -hmm. And you're so good at this. Let's just talk it out. Mm -hmm. Let's hear. And then let me, let me speak into those weird, not fully formed brain thoughts of yours. <laughs> and help me out here, buddy. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it this another way. and Just reframe the situation. Mm -hmm. I've talked a lot about recently the need to look at how overwhelming our lives are and all the craziness and the busyness and mm -hmm. blah, 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 as actually abundance, that it's not overwhelm, it's abundant, that we've got these abundant gifts the Lord's given us to steward. And aren't these answers to the prayers we prayed, you know, like it's, and now we're, we're having a hard time with them. Come on. It's like, so good to remember. Yeah. And I think that's what we got to call our kids to is to reframe and redefine mm -hmm. and just rethink about things in the upside down kingdom. I love that you also hit on the fact that it's not just this linear progression mm. of like, we're going to go through this hard thing and then it's over. Right. That there is a return to grief or there is a return to sorrow that can be sparked even in the happiest moments. Oh, gosh. That's yes. something that I really, having not had the type of childhood trauma that my youngest had, mm -hmm. I didn't understand that something like Christmas or a birthday party, a place that's supposed to be a happy time could yeah. actually trigger a lot of grief over who wasn't there who was missing that. Mm. And I think there's yeah. a lot of people that are going through that and they don't, they feel almost guilt or shame for not feeling the way everyone else does in that moment. But yeah. I mean, what we've learned as a family is to say, Hey buddy, I realize that so-and-so is not here or that, you know, it makes me sad or what are you thinking? And, and as time has gone on, that's gotten a lot better, but I think not ignoring it, talking about it really helps. Absolutely. And yeah, acknowledging like mm -hmm. you, I don't know. Why don't you tell me how you are feeling right mm -hmm. now? And then from the, letting them lead it a bit, so you're not implanting like, I bet you feel sad. <laughs> I bet you feel happy. No, let them tell you what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but then responding to that with um, some wisdom, mm -hmm. hopefully. I had someone tell me one time that uh, healing through grief, healing through trauma we often think that it's like an onion, you know, that you peel back the layers and it's very clean. And once that layer's gone, you're to the next layer. But in reality, it's like a plate of spaghetti noodles. Uh -huh. And that when you pull out this one spaghetti noodle, that these others move and expose. And then this one noodle touches a new noodle and oh, that feels gosh. different. Yeah, and yeah. I think, I think we need to talk about that a little bit more mm. too, because I think so often people think that, um, that healing or processing should be this clean thing that you just remove like a band aid. Right. And in reality, sometimes it'll expose something new or it will, you know, a pain will hit something else and it'll feel different. And there's a new way of looking at it. And that is growth. Right. It just doesn't always feel that way. It doesn't always feel that way. Absolutely. I, I very much think these things are cycles mm. <laughs> that, you know, it's not like you get hope. And then you go to the beach vacation for the rest of your life right. that you feel hope to then get back into the heart that mm -hmm. comes the side of heaven in this world with a more fortified version of your hopeful self. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually an accurate reading of Romans 5, 3, that suffering produces perseverance, character, hope, and hope will not put us to shame. I would say so that we can go back into the suffering, mm -hmm. but built different because of where we've been and more fortified 
to then go through that cycle again of suffering, mm -hmm. perseverance, character, hope, and then back into the suffering, the yeah. hurt, the ongoing hurt of this world, but with an ongoing hope. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel a pressure or something inside of yourself that you maybe want to shield your kids from pain or suffering sometimes that you oh. feel like there's a lot in the world and in our family already? Oh. Maybe I need to pull back on some stuff and hide it from them? Um, interesting question. With the older one now, no, not really. If anything, I want to expose him to more. I mm -hmm. think kids are so overly protected from hard stuff in our world. And um, and yet with my newly nine-year-old son, I'm like, hey, we don't need to know that pain yet. Mm -hmm. Enough will come. Enough mm -hmm. hard things are, are going to hit you later. But I do want also him not to be shell-shocked when mm -hmm. expectations are not met as an adult. So he hopefully will get there soon enough. Or probably, I mean, I'm no therapist, but 13, 14 would seem age appropriate to start really engaging the pain of this world. So your narration on a good hard life is different based on age and experience. I think so. Yeah, I think that would be... I don't know. We all got to listen and tune in to David Thomas and Sissy Golf and some experts on um, all the things with kids. But yeah, that's that's how it looks to me. I'm living a weird um, world of different stages, big time, eight years apart boys. So in real time, I'm seeing different um, responses to the same family story. Mm -hmm. So what about people that are listening that their kids are having different responses? Maybe yeah. their kid is entering a story of suffering right now and it's making them afraid of the world. Right. What, what would you say to that? Family? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I spoke um, several years ago at a women's event and we did a and a at the end and it was about teaching your kids how to live a good heart story or something. And a mother asked, well, what, how do you not, passed on or how, how does dread not enter the story for children mm -hmm. like how do you make them not dread what's coming in mm -hmm. this world and um, i thought that was a really good question i did not have the perfect answer to it because probably inside all of us there is a little dread mm -hmm. of how hard things can be in this world but i'm not sure if that's wrong honestly mm -hmm. That a small, I wouldn't say dread, just a deep, realistic point of view is that life is going to disappoint you yeah. and let you down. And there are very sad things. And I would not want for dread to be a part of the story, but more a realistic understanding that all is not going to be perfect and shiny mm -hmm. and happy your whole life through, baby. Mm -hmm. You know, like... Uh, an engagement of this is a fallen world and horrible mm -hmm. things happen mm -hmm. is so important. We often talk with our kids about their belief in two things that do you believe that God is sovereign and do you believe that God is good? Right. Because it requires both of those things. I think for us to have true peace and hope in those times that we do become filled with dread or we right. do become afraid and that when things pop up that are so awful and hard, if we can remind ourselves, God is in control mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And he's also good. He says that he's working all things for the good of those right. that love totally. him and are called according to his purpose. And that is who we are. Right. And so he is working this out. And um, I also give that I love giving my kids little just one liners. And I always say, trust the story. Trust the story. We're going to trust the story that right. God is writing. You always say God is writing a good story, right? Right. That, yeah. And, and it's a hard story, but it, good. Totally. And you know what I think is so important um, to say on this podcast and anywhere is for me to very humbly admit to all listeners, I don't understand that. I do yes. not understand the sovereignty of God <clears throat> and the goodness of God coexisting yeah. in the same story. And it's so complex. Mm -hmm. I will be unpacking it my whole <laughs> life. So teaching to my children might imply I have the answers mm -hmm. and just putting it out there real clear. I do not. Susan, I 
would venture to say you don't fully know absolutely not yeah and that is part of teaching our children a posture of humility that's where faith steps in i have faith in these things because god says it and that's what i have to hold on to right that's what i'm anchoring my life on yes is what his word says i believe it totally even if i don't fully understand exactly it's part of the mystery and i love teaching my children that Mm -hmm. of we do not know all of the answers Mm -hmm. and you get to spend your whole life unpacking the Mm -hmm. complicated realities of our faith i remember my oldest when she um, oh my gosh was probably four or five years old and had learned about the trinity and we were riding in the car and she kept asking me to help her understand it. And so I did all the typical analogies of like, it's the egg with the shell and the white and the yolk. And it's, you know, all the different things. And this probably went on for maybe two weeks. And she was like, no, that's not it. No, 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 that's not it. And finally, after lots of prayer for wisdom, and she asked me again one day, and I said, honey, if we could understand the complexities of God, especially in a four-year-old mind, Like, is that a God that would be worthy of your worship? Is that the kind of God that you would have faith in to to be holding everything together? It's the great mystery. And she sat there for a minute, thought, and she went, okay, that's good. I'll take that. (laughs) You you reached her with that. I love that. You reached her with it. But it's true. We have to live with this mystery that there's a submission to not having all the answers and trusting that he does and that he's going to work that out. And so much in our world, and we're really trying to teach our boys this, we think it's so important, is like, I know all, I know best, I know everything. And the humility, I don't Mm -hmm. have all of the answers, Mm -hmm. and I want to listen and learn and process prayerfully. It's just missing in our world. So we're trying to bring it back. Or what I thought was so right last year i've learned more and lived more and now that has evolved and changed yeah and that's okay right it's okay to say my my understanding of something has grown and changed right totally so let's switch gears for a second and talk a little bit about just boots on the ground when it comes to things getting really hard yeah so what are some things in your life that you feel like just let that go right now that it's not important that the laundry gets done or it's not important that we're eating at a certain time every night. What are the things in your household that you let go when things start squeezing and getting tough? Interesting question. I've always, hmm, how would I answer that? I've got to always let whatever go that needs to go. (laughs) So it's a funny question for me. We should let Jay Wolf answer. He'd be more honest. Um, (laughs) I kind of am willing to let all things go, Mm -hmm. like trash the house and not think twice about it, but that's probably not the best way to live. (laughs) Um, But I I hope that I am willing to kind of, just show grace for whatever needs to go when it needs to go mm-hmm. and the things are falling apart and we're busy or uh, everything does not have to be perfect all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably what your question yeah. is getting to is, are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm great with that. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to ever be perfect. But it's okay to miss an activity or a rehearsal or Maybe we're doing church from home this morning because we can't get out of our Uh, PJs. Totally. totally. We're going to order dinner in again tonight, even though we ordered it in last night. And and those things in the long run, they're not what matters. You know, it's it's the the sanity and the the calmness that you can try to create. Like, how can we alleviate some of that pressure off of ourselves Mm. to try to live this life that we see so many other people living? Right. Yeah. And I think that's a special kind of bonding your family gets to do when you get to say like, we're not going to keep up with them. We're just doing our own thing. And we yeah. are going to have to order takeout and eat at 9 p.m. and kind of laugh about it. And it's so refreshing. I feel like more and more people are starting to kind of share that. Maybe even if they were living that way behind the scenes, they weren't yeah. always sharing it right, with yeah, everyone yeah, else. Maybe so, yeah. You know, it's okay to come to carpool with the top knot and the you know, not looking so whatever you think it needs to be. That's okay. For sure. I love to give people the gift of me looking and seeming like a total wreck (laughs) because like that's freeing. I loved, I remember years ago, I read in one of Sean and Nyquist's earliest books that people should leave your house 
feeling better about their life mm -hmm. and not worse. Mm -hmm. And they struck me so deeply that the gifts of a perfect house to the, you know, the visitor are very small because they're immediately like, oh, well, my house isn't looking mm -hmm. this good, or I don't have it this together, or they leave feeling worse. Whereas if maybe things are perfect in my home and I'm getting to show them a picture of, hey, and this is me in my robe without makeup, and I trust you, you're my friend, like come in and feel cozy and happy, you'll leave feeling better about mm -hmm. your life. And I think that's such a gift we can give each other. What does it look like for you as a mom to find encouragement from other people, other places in the times that, that you feel like I don't have it in me to narrate correctly right now? Like I need some encouragement. How do you, how do you respond in those moments? How do, do I feel encouraged yeah. essentially? Oh God. Well, I feel very encouraged in this moment by my sweet friend uh, doing my podcast with me and my other sweet friend over there, Leah, <laughs> editing as we go. But I feel encouraged uh, by a lot of things. A lot of what we're doing right now. I listen to a lot of podcasts and feel encouraged. A lot of sermons feel very encouraged. I'm um, being with wonderful people. Just going deep and processing the word of God in my head and heart does a lot for me. Um, what else really encourages me? I would say sitting on my porch with a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. looking into the trees encourages me. And yeah, your question, I imagine, is begging the question. So then when you when your tank is full, that's when you can be the most mm -hmm. to show up for your kids. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that's what you're getting to is I have to fill my tank so that I can fill theirs. Yes. And that requires putting the oxygen mask on myself <laughs> first. And I think I do that. I hope I don't, from a place of being empty, want to pour out to my kids. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Susie? I imagine you have some great answer to this. Well, I think for me, having those friends that know me well enough and know my heart well enough that I can call and just say things, even if I don't even really mean it because I'm just trying to process mm -hmm. and that they, I, it's just a place that I can just ugh, let it, let it go. And then they come behind me with truth and encouragement and there's space for that. Mm. And of course, like you said, the word and things like that. But to me, I think creating moments of silence is really restorative mm -hmm. for me to just sit without anything else but the opportunity for the Lord to move and speak has been something I've been practicing a lot, contemplating scripture just one over and over. I love the that. different words, saying it out loud. Um, yeah. And I think vacationing is oh, sort of yeah. going on trips with friends, going out to eat. I think all those kinds of things we need to make space for ourselves so that we can pour back into our kids. Totally. When, when we moved to Atlanta, I think, Jay, I, how many years? And there was at, 10 and a half after my stroke. We kind of turned a corner with thinking, now I can stay independently, even if it's just for one night all yeah. by myself. Because one thing that my therapist pinpointed years ago is I'm never alone. Mm -hmm. Like I'm very rarely ever by myself. Yeah. And I needed to change that for many reasons. I mean, there's a lot of work being done around the power of being alone now in yeah. solitude. And so now I call it my annual eat, pray, hope, <laughs> where I stay by myself in the house for a night and spend 24 hours with no talking. Amazing. Just make Amazing. myself be silent for a full 24 hours and don't numb out with the screen. Don't really do much of anything, mm -hmm. but just like small, sweet, slow reading, sitting on my mm. porch. Really it's already doing... making me breathe deep hearing you explain all yeah. this. It's so good. You, everybody needs an eat, pray, hope in their lives. Oh, the yeah. 24 hours of just me time where mm -hmm. I eat everything I want to eat. It's so fun. And um, just go really slow. Mm -hmm. I think I try to stay in my bathroom for at least half of it. And um, yeah, just really fill up that, that oxygen tank to the max. I love it. I want to go right now. Yeah, go. Get your thought. Eat, pray, hope. So before we leave, I have one last question. What would you want to say to someone that's out there wrestling with the idea that maybe they want a different story for their child? 
maybe they don't want the story that their child is living in right now. Mm, yeah. It's so hard to both like hear that child and really be in there with them and also call them to own their story on that tension is what we're, we're called to do as parents. And I would say making that child feel so chosen mm. and seen in their story and assigned to that story that I think it's our job as parents to really call out in our kids, you know, for some reason, I do not understand. This is the way God is having you live your life. Mm -hmm. This is, this is where you are. And don't miss this. Like, don't waste the pain of this story. And little girl or boy, God is doing something so powerful through this pain and this life. And you may not have eyes to see it yet, but you will. You will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Mark it down. It may be years from now, but you're pain is not wasted mm. in this story and ephesians 4 1 is true that you baby girl are called to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received to listen mm. you've been called to this story so you need to like live it well it's just such an encouragement to oh. see that you choose to live this way yourself every day and speak it into your friends and your children oh. and you truly are just such a beacon of hope and it's just so fun to get to sit and listen to you share this oh my goodness it's a joy to have susan robinson join me on the podcast because she would be a parent of which I want to learn so much oh. of how to do this. I can remember as we close up all this, I can remember years ago, you, I mean, you're, this is when we still lived in California and came and stayed with y'all. You had, maybe it was on the side of your fridge, like a list of mission statements that the kids had written for your family. Mm -hmm. And throughout the year, if they would do something decidedly the opposite of the <laughs> mission statement, you would simply refer to it and say, hey, Kyla, you said this <laughs> here. I wrote it down. So talk to me about where we are now based on like, how do we reconcile this yeah. and finding a back to it, the mission yeah. statement. And I don't think that's accomplishing your mission here. Right? Yes, exactly. That's like brilliant. Like, <laughs> you said this. So now I'm just reminding you of this. And I, I just learned so much from the power of narrating and re-narrating. Susan, you got to answer our final question. So Susan, what is good in your story? What is hard in your story? And how do you live in the tension of both of those in your good, hard story? Wow. 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 I mean, I think what is good in my story right now is the confidence I feel in my mid forties, just being who I am. Ooh, that's and so yeah, I think like too. accepting my own place and my own story. And I'm so happy with um, just the marriage that I have, the kids that I have, the work that we put in, in our twenties and thirties to, to get to where we are. It's sweet to live mm. in the fruit of that, yeah. the fruit of the healing and the, and the hard work. And I think what's hard is we are really entering that sandwich season. My mother recently had a stroke I know, and is I having know. some more complications even today. And, um, mm. I think caring for young children, children in college, you know, starting to, to care for parents. Oh, that, yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, a lot. It's a hard season, but um, I think the way I live in that tension is all the things we've talked about today is yeah. inviting other people into it, yeah. um, not isolating, finding um, space to fill myself so mm -hmm. that I can pour back out and, and just trusting that God has prepared me for this moment and positioned me right. to be here. And, yes. you know, every morning when I start my day, I thank him that I woke up and uh, I ask him for wisdom every morning. Give me wisdom today, God, give me wisdom mm. as I interact today. And I think that that um, leaves me at the end of the day when I'm going through my day with him, as I'm closing my eyes and trying to wind my brain down that I can um, 
filter it through that, you know, God, did you give me everything I needed? Yes, you did. Cause I asked and I will receive. And so, um, I think I've let go in this season of my life of the pressure to have everything be perfect and to receive what is. Mm. And that's good and hard, like you said. Yeah, and there's something so settling. Mm. And I, yes, I, I cannot agree more. Something about mid forties. I'm almost <laughs> mid forties. Is is that? Is I just I actually love it here. Yeah, I love my life yeah. right now. And yeah. maybe it took a while to say that, <laughs> but maybe the mid forties is exactly the time amidst some really hard stuff, right. like mothers in the hospital mm -hmm. and children in college and still children in the thick of eighth grade. <laughs> oh, wow. You got it all. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. What a beautiful answer, Susie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, just all of your insights. You're just so wise and I'm so grateful and such a thoughtful Christ follower. I think I am so drawn to you because of how you both are so just deeply kind and thoughtful in your walk with the Lord, that you're wrestling with all the things. And I love that about you. Hey, my friend. Uh, I don't know about me, but we'll keep going, won't we, listeners? We will keep tuning in. Hopefully you better. And uh, growing together. I pray you are. I'm growing and just continuing to think and process through our good, hard lives. We'll talk to you next week. Bye.